closer. Sometimes, demons tell the truth. I know, I know, there are doctrines of demons which are lies, but that does not negate the truth that sometimes demons do tell the truth. We know that there are doctrines of demons that contradict the scriptures because the scriptures tell us there are doctrines of demons. The Apostle Paul writes to us in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 2, from the Concordant Literal New Testament. Now the Spirit is saying explicitly that in subsequent eras, some will be withdrawing from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and the teachings of demons. In the hypocrisy of false expressions, their own conscience having been cauterized. So we can see here that there are teachings of demons, otherwise known as doctrines of demons, which are deceiving, which are leading people astray, which are causing people to withdraw from the faith. And these are often known because they are false expressions that cannot be supported in the scriptures. Let's listen in as Judy, a faithful tither and member of the Mount Zion, Bethlehem, Third Reform, Baptist Brotherhood and Sisterhood, Church of the Chosen, Redeemed Saints of God, attempts to dispense multiple doctrines of demons onto her new neighbor, Candy. God is a trinity, dear. OMG, there is my lucky number. Jesus only saved the chosen. Oh, that sucks. God will torment the rest forever. Turn or burn, bitches, right, Judy? Very good, dear. Looks like Judy's going to put candy into the Baptist bucket. We don't know a lot about demons from the scriptures, but there are some details in there. One key detail is given to us in the book of James. James 2.19 reveals something very telling about demons. You are believing that God is one. Ideally, are you doing? The demons also are believing and are shuddering. We see here that demons can and often do believe the truth. But because demons are in opposition to the truth, they are shuddering. The Greek word that is translated as shuddering means to tremble violently from fright. So demons have a tremendous fear of God and a tremendous fear of Jesus. And as we go through some of the true statements of the demons, we will realize the fear that they had in the presence of Jesus. I want to share with you now some of the instances of demonic truth from the scriptures. In Mark 1, 24, we read the words of the demons to Jesus. We are aware of who you are, the Holy One of God. Mark 3, 11 through 12. And the unclean spirits, whenever they beheld him, prostrated to him and cried, saying that you are the Son of God. And from Mark 5, 6 through 9. And perceiving Jesus from afar, he ran and worships him. And crying with a loud voice, he is saying, What is it to me and to thee, Jesus, Son of God Most High? I am adjuring thee by God, not me, shouldst thou be tormenting. For he said to it, Come out, unclean spirit, out of the man. And he inquired of it, What is your name? And it is saying to him, Legion is my name, for many are we. And Luke 4.41 Now demons also came out from many, clamoring and saying that you are the Christ, the Son of God. And rebuking them, he did not let them speak, for they had perceived that he is the Christ. And in Luke 8, 28, Now perceiving Jesus and crying out, he prostrates to him and said in a loud voice, What is it to me and to thee, Jesus, Son of God Most High? But there is one additional verse I want us to look at, where demons pose a very interesting question to Jesus that contradicts the false teaching of eternal or everlasting torment. Matthew 8, 28 through 29. And at Jesus coming to the other side, to the country of the Gergesenes, two demoniacs meet him, who are coming out of the tombs, very ferocious, so that no one is strong enough to be passing by through that road. And lo, they crying said, What is it to us and to thee, Son of God? Did thou come here to torment us before the season? We see very clearly here that these demons knew that Jesus was the Son of God. And it appears that they, like the rest of the demons, were fearing him. They were shuddering in his presence because they knew who he was and they knew they were in opposition to him. I want us to focus on this very last question that they posed to him. Did thou come here to torment us before the season? These demons knew that there was torment ahead of them. These demons knew that if Jesus tormented them now, it would be before the season. Before what season? The season of torment. 
The word season means a distinct portion of time having special characteristics. That season will have a beginning and an end, just as we've learned in many other videos that an eon has a beginning and an end. So this season of torment is not yet for these demons, but it will come, and it will have an end because it is only a season. It is not everlasting. It is not eternal. It is not forever. It is not never-ending. So, smartass, based on this one verse, you're going against all those Christians who teach eternal torment? Thank you, snarky girl, for your very good question. No, you can't base any doctrine on one verse in the scriptures. But there is not one verse in the scriptures that teaches everlasting or eternal torment. In fact, when we look at the torment of Satan, it too is limited. So, yes, I am going against what all those Christians teach about eternal torment, but it's not just based on this one verse. Have a look, snarky girl. Revelation 20:10. And the adversary who is deceiving them was cast into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the wild beast and where the false prophet are also. And they shall be tormented day and night for the eons of the eons. It is not forever. It is not for eternity. It is not everlasting. It is for the eons of the eons. Their torment is limited. All right, smartass, then what? What happens after their torment ends? Thank you again, Snarky Girl, for another great question. God has already got this all figured out. Jesus has already done the hard work to make this a reality, the salvation of all, including demons and Satan. Again, let's go to the scriptures, snarky girl. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Christ Jesus is the image of the invisible God, firstborn of every creature. For in him is all created, that in the heavens and that on the earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or lordships or sovereignties or authorities, all is created through him and for him. And he is before all, and all has its cohesion in him. And he is the head of the body, the ecclesia, who is sovereign, firstborn from among the dead, that in all he may be becoming first. For in him the entire complement delights to dwell, and through him to reconcile all to him, making peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, whether those on the earth or those in the heavens. In the yellow, we see all of the alls in this passage. Verse 16, in him is all created. And again, at the end of verse 16, all is created through him and for him. Verse 17, he is before all and all has its cohesion in him. Everything is held together by the power of God through Christ. In verse 18, that in all he may be becoming first. Verse 20, through him to reconcile all to him. All that is created in the green here, that in the heavens and that on the earth, are the same all that is going to be reconciled. Verse 20, those on the earth or those in the heavens. So we see in the blue that all that is created in verse 16 is the same as the all that's going to be reconciled in verse 20. And all of this is brought about, the reconciliation in the magenta purplish color, is because he is making peace through the blood of his cross. The hard work to reconcile all to God and to bring salvation to all of God's creation has been done by Jesus' work on the cross through his blood. The demons and Satan were all included in this creation by Christ, so they are also included in the reconciliation that was brought about by his work on the cross. And one more passage to show you one of the highest and greatest visions and realities that will come to be in God's creation because of the work of Christ on behalf of the creation. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Wherefore also God highly exalts Christ Jesus and graces him with the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should be bowing, celestial and terrestrial and subterranean, and every tongue should be acclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord for the glory of God the Father. There are two parts to this passage. We see the first section in green. God highly exalts Christ Jesus and graces him with the name that is above every name. This part has been done. God has highly exalted his son because of his son's work and because of who his son is. The second parts of this in the green, in the name of Jesus, every knee should be bowing. And in verse 11, every tongue should be acclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord. These two are connected by the yellow and the word that. So the first part that has been done was done so that 
the second parts would also be accomplished, and those are yet future. But because the first part is already done, this guarantees that the second part will also be done. And this includes demons and Satan. In the name of Jesus, every knee should be bowing, and every tongue should be acclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord, because his name is above every name. If this video has helped you understand some of the great big truths about our great God and our great Savior, go ahead and hit the like button. I promise I will not tell your pastor. And to continue to grow in these great truths of our great God and Savior, click on this video right here.